My T1 is broke. What do I do? And to be fair, it's not my T1. My T1 is sitting here in rude health. But it is the uh, plea from one of the subscribers to the channel that his T1 is broke. Now, rather than me tell you what is wrong with it, why don't I let Jeff do it himself? Hey there, music tech guy. Greetings from Alberta, Canada, Calgary specifically. Um, I got a hold of you on your YouTube channel uh, maybe a week or two ago and it's kind of describing the problems I was having with this Korg T1. Uh, and I'm like a total, total noob. I've never owned a keyboard, ne never really played it. And uh, I'm a guitar guy and I, I more got it just for learning music theory, honestly. And I got such a good deal from it from this church here in town. Uh, I decided to buy it, but uh, I haven't been able to figure it out. So I'm just going to turn it on and uh, let you hear kind of what it's doing. And maybe you can diagnose the problem. I'm not sure if I'm just, you know, you know, too much of a novice to figure out how to program this thing or uh, if there's a component that needs uh, switching out. I don't know. Maybe factory reset. I don't think I have the disc for that anyways, but, and I don't really think that's what it is, but, you know, I'm sure you'll be able to figure it out. Okay, what I'm going to do is, uh, I'm just going to turn this camera around, let you see, uh, see the screen, I'm just going to aim it, I'm going to turn it on, reach up back behind to turn this on, you can see it says Korg T1, Cosmic Rain. awful sound so if I hit start stop it's, it stops making that sound and if I hit a key so you can kind of hear what's going on there um, maybe you can help me diagnose this thing. so I can stop making noise and start making music baby thanks Jeff as you can see, a very ill Cork T1. Remember, like, comment, subscribe to the channel. Go over to Instagram and follow me there. Go over to Facebook, follow me there. That's where the normal notices are. And consider becoming a Patreon. The problem with these sort of problems <laughs> um, with electronic circuitry is where do you start? My first port of call is normally the power um, because these things normally are caused by something and a lot of my experience tells me that it's normally caused by some sort of power instability um, that has generally caused the low voltage circuitry to error. I mean, generally it can be the fact that these components on these circuit boards are getting old. Uh, your Cork T1, circa early 90s, here we are, 2021, you know, that's 30 years. And these components have been sitting in these machines for 30 years. So it's not inconceivable, they're just getting old and you just need to replace them. Things like electrolyte capacitors, for argument's sake, will only have a certain shelf life. Now, I can tell you that looking inside my T1, uh, the capacitors on the board have been changed. I don't know when they were changed, but they have been changed at some point because there was a failure. And you'll see my board in a minute. But the first thing I would do is I would start with the, the circuitry, uh, sorry, the power, the power supply and the power supply circuitry. And then I would start looking for obvious other problems and I'll walk you through those in a sec. Now, it just so happens that about the time that Jeff's video came in about his problems he's having with his T1, Richard, who has had my T1 on loan, 
uh, a fellow South Coast synth nut, uh, had just returned it. So it's here. So I can actually show you um, the inside of my T1. Now I've done videos in the past, you've seen inside the T1, there's other, other people on the uh, uh, on YouTube that have opened a T1 up, but this is my T1 and I've opened it up. Now one thing I should say about the T1 is there's no support to keep this lid up. Um, so when you do open a T1 up like this, it's always good to have a block of wood. And if I do this, you can see my block of wood, which is here, okay? And I just use that, I just prop that up under there because it then stops that falling down on my head, okay? So, uh, there you go, stops it falling down. Um, just holds the lid up. There's no, there's no mechanism in here for actually holding the lid up. Um, and if it does, if you do knock it, it will come down on your head. And um, I've got a few bruises around here where it has come down on my head in the past, which is now why I use a block of wood. <laughs> anyway, let's start by looking at the power supply. You've seen the power supply in the T1 before um, on videos I've done, but this is effectively the power supply. Um, and I'm not quite sure whether it comes across on video, but this piece here, it's, by the way, this is, this is actually switched off at the moment and earthed. Um, but this piece here, tells me it's a 220 volt supply with a board number KLM uh, 1376A and at the boards are, ch are different for different voltage areas of the world so there is a specific board for the uh, Far East Japan region which is uh, 100 volts and then there's a specific volt for all those areas in the world that work on 120 110, 120 volts. Okay, so, you know, be mindful of what I'm saying. However, this pin layout here, so this connector, there's a connector that should be there, a connector there, and this connector here are exactly the same on every single board uh, that the, that called made for the T1. So effectively, everything from, oops, I've just dropped that, everything from here down, is the same on a Korg T1 apart from this particular board. Okay, so just bear that in mind. Anyway, as I say, these um, uh, connectors here are all the same on every single board. So this first connector, which has a green wire and, and all brown wires, which is extremely helpful for tracing them through, goes to the what I would call the logic board, okay, and that's this board here which is KLM 1370. Uh, and that's where all the, the processing for the Korg T1 is done. And as you can see, that's where the, the memory cards come into that particular board. Um, this uh, piece here, which is the connector that's not connected, which is this connector here, is actually for powering the backlight on the display. Now, if you've watched the channel, you know I replaced the backlight or the display with an, uh, a brand new LED display. It uses far less power and therefore doesn't need that connected anymore. So that is why that is hanging here and it's actually disconnected inside the board as well. So I don't need that. I just didn't remove the wire just in case I needed to put it back at some point. Um, this connector here goes to what I, what I would term as the audio board. So that's the um, uh, KLM uh, 1373 board which is the one up in the far corner here and you probably can't see it because it's off camera uh, and then this connector here is actually the connector that provides power to the floppy okay and if you want to make sure that this is doing its job properly um, the first thing is if you had it on for a while just take a, a visual temperature reading of these two heat sinks if these two heat sinks are running extremely hot as in you can't physically touch them like that then the reality is you've probably got something going wrong with the circuitry um, now the way to test that is to disconnect the power these these connectors and you do that just by literally just pulling them straight up like so and I say there's no power on this machine so it doesn't really matter where I'm putting them at the moment like so if I pull all three of those out and just move them to one side and then there is a pin-out diagram for this um, in the service manual 
Now there is the pinout diagram. Uh, it's very, the, the version I've got of the service manual is a really, really poor copy. Um, and it's everything on here is, is sort of kind of blurry. Um, but the pinouts is five volts, five volts, ground, ground, 12, plus 12 volts, minus 12 volts. Okay, on the first connector, the second connector is uh, minus 12 volts, uh, sorry, plus 12 volts, minus 12 volts, plus 5 volts, ground, 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 and this one here is plus 5 volts and ground as the second one. So what you want to do is just go along these pins with a multimeter, um, something that looks like that, okay, and just go along those pins and make sure that you're seeing more or less 5 volts and 12 volts on the, re on the relevant pins. If you're not seeing 5 volts and 12 volts on those pins, then there is a fairly good chance that this is what's causing your problem. And if you then go and look around the board, and as I say, at some point these have been replaced. Um, I don't know when they've been replaced, but they have been replaced. Uh, and I suspect the reason why they were replaced is if you look over here, you can see this blackening around this area here. Now I've gone through and I've tested these components a couple of years back and they're all, all okay. So somebody before me has been in here and I suspect it was one of these resistors and uh, that component there that were causing the problem. And that blackening tells me it was overheating and probably burnt out. So that's why I'm saying I'm, that's how I know that this stuff's been replaced because when I took the board off and had a look at the underside I could see these things being resoldered in and then somebody's um, glued them back in with this horrible glue stuff which I don't like but you know it makes sure they all stay on the board so that's the first thing I'd do is I'd look at this area here and make sure that you've got the appropriate voltages coming off now I know that my voltages are plus or minus a little bit pretty much bang on 12 and 5 volts because I tested them funny enough the other day when I was preparing for this video so if I plug these back in, and I say, just be careful when you're doing this, you don't bend any pins, but effectively, if you square these up nicely and do that, they will all plug in nicely. And so there's no power on this, but I do actually have an earth run into this at the moment. So I've got a cable with an earth in it, um, just to make sure the whole chassis is grounded. Anyway, that's the first thing I would do. The next thing I do in this situation is I would look at four uh, dry joints. And the way I do that is with my trusty magnifying glass, which is this thing that's waving around in front of the camera. Um, now, this is the great thing about changing the way the workshop is set up uh, a few weeks back, is that I now have unlimited or loads of USB sockets for this thing to power into. So this is a, a powered, LED, so there's the LED. Um, you can change the colour of it, so you can go from this sort of pure, pure white one to a, uh, a less um, colour temperature, so that's, and then you go up to a really cool blue colour temperature. And I tend not to use the warm one very much for this sort of work, but the, the other two are very useful because they illuminate the board very well. And what I would do here is basically go over the circuit board. And what you're looking for, and I'm not going to find any on mine because I've already done this exercise a few years ago with this particular board, is you're looking for areas where you see cracks in the solder. I'm just going over this, looking for this, because I, when I took this board out a few years ago, when I got the T1 and, and did a whole load of work on it, um, all these uh, uh, audio jacks that are all along this outside here, they're not all audio jacks, they're jacks for other things as well, um, but a load of these were cracked, so I um, basically repaired those. And the repair is quite simple, just get a hot soldering iron, apply the hot soldering iron to the um, the solder and just reflow it. And when you do that, probably what you need to do at the same time is go and get some flux compound, uh, some resin flux, something like that. Okay, 
and just put that over the top of it before you heat it and that will allow the solder to reflow and fix the cracks. Now if it doesn't fix the crack you might need to just put a dab of new solder on um, to the joints. But using this and going over the joints I can see very clearly when I was looking at it a minute ago what joints were good and what joints weren't good. Now this um, is a great little device uh, I can turn it. I can turn the intensity up. I can turn it off. I'm just going to turn it off like that. And normally, when I'm working with this, it normally sits on a stand. Um, let me just turn it around so you can see the other end. There you go. So this thing here plugs into a stand that sits on the bench, and therefore it holds over the work. But at the moment, I've just got it uh, free form, so I can show you that in front of the T1. It's at this point, now that you've looked at the circuit board, you've tried to make sure you've eliminated dry joints, uh, and you'd be surprised how much um, damage a dry joint can actually do. <laughs> but if you've eliminated dry joints, the next thing to do is to start looking for signs of damage. And what do I mean by damage? I'm not talking about um, breaks in the circuit board, but there could be breaks in the circuit board. And hopefully when you went over the circuit board with the magnifying glass, you would have followed the tracks across just to see if any of the tracks were actually damaged. Now, what could happen with a circuit board is people have been known to drop keyboards. And when keyboards get dropped, um, the shock wave inside the board can crack the circuit boards. Because these things effectively, if you look in here, they're just held to the board with sticks. So in uh, in the case of the, the computer logic board here, it's got one, two, three, four, four fixings at the back to the to the backboard, and then one, two fixings at the front. Uh, yeah, I don't think there's any other fixings on here. So effectively, it's fixed in four points. Now, when the when the case is dropped and the shockwave goes through the case, it's possible that that will effectively uh, cause the circuit board to crack. Now I know I can't show you uh, a crack here. Um, if you go and look at the video I did on the SY55, I ended up having to glue the circuit board back together and then create jumpers to allow the, electricity, the electrical connectivity to continue. Not my finest piece of soldering work, I will admit, but it does the trick and it makes that, that, it makes that board work again. Um, but you're looking for, you can, in terms of damage, you're looking for that sort of thing. So look for, you know, signs that the keyboard's been dropped. If it's been dropped, then there's a good chance you may have a circuit break somewhere and you need to go and find out where that circuit break is. The second type of damage you're looking for is heat damage, where a component has blown. And a couple of minutes ago, I showed you the circuit board in my T1 and you saw that there was heat damage where components had blown. So effectively too much current, too much voltage was running across those components, they heat up, they cause the board to discolour around them because of the heat and it's ob very obvious that you've got a problem there. Now you might not end up replacing one component, you might have to replace several components because the component that's gone pop is not necessarily the component that's causing you problems. Um, and if you're not comfortable with circuitry, if you see that kind of thing, it's probably that's the point to uh, uh, go off to your, your local service tech and get them to look at the components around the one that was showing signs of heat wear and get some components replaced for you. The third thing you're looking for on a board, and this is a fairly obvious one, is looking for electrolytic ca capacitor damage. Now, electrolytic capacitors, by their very nature and the name of the capacitor, work by having fluid in them. Okay, and if, they, if the capacitor starts to break down, the fluid starts to leak, and it's nasty stuff, electrolytic capacitor fluid. Okay, so you want to try and get those capacitors off the board as quickly as possible and then use some isopropyl alcohol and probably some distilled water to clean the board. I have been known to put the boards into a uh, sonic chamber with some PCB cleaning fluid 
that does a beautiful job on getting rid of that sort of stuff off the board. But on the flip side, remember, don't plug the board in until it's fully dried. Now, I used to have an airing cupboard um, uh, where I lived many years ago, and that was great for drying boards out because you just stuck them in the airing, airing cupboard for a week, and the cycle of the hot water being heated up would create, generate heat and dry them out quite nicely. I don't have an airing cupboard, so what I tend to do at the moment is um, uh, I put them on a clothesline. <laughs> <laughs> which sounds daft, but I, I do actually put them on a, uh, on a mini clothesline that I have rigged up in the uh, goldfish bowl above the uh, radiator and leave them there for three or four days uh, for them to dry out. If the heating's on, it takes, it's quicker. Obviously in the summer, there's no heating, so you're letting it, making it work through atmospheric heat. So that, they're, the, they're the sort of the next stages of my diagnostic on this. And this is the final stage of my diagnostic journey when I'm trying to work out what's gone wrong with the synthesizer. This is where I get an oscilloscope out. Okay, I don't have my oscilloscope here on the bench to show you, um, but I do have it, it's packed away. Um, and I only really go and get it from storage when I know I've got to do a repair that requires me to have an oscilloscope. Um, because it's, it's a, well, I mean, it's the size, it's, it's effectively the size of a 2U rack mount unit with a set of legs on it. Um, but that's my oscilloscope. And you use an oscilloscope effectively to go around the circuit board looking for um, the transmission of signals between components. Um, if you can't if you can't spot an obvious reason why your your synth is is erroring, then this is where you need to get really quite deep and technical, and you need to trace round the circuit board with an oscilloscope. Now, in in the case of what Jeff is reporting, and I kind of haven't mentioned Jeff because it's all been kind of generic stuff, but what Jeff is reporting is effectively something is generating noise. Okay, so, and when he presses the start stop button, effectively what he's doing, I think, is he's sending a signal that overrides the passive noise that's being generated. So, what I think is going on, I think you've got something on your audio circuit that is is in, is in an error state. And when you press the start stop button, effectively you're sending a control yet yeah, on off signal that cancels that default state and overrides it, which is why it gets quieter. And then when you press a key on the keyboard, you're then sending a signal, a waveform to the amplifier on the board to effectively send out to the audio input. So I think my gut feel is the problem is somewhere in that audio circuit. I don't think it's in the generation circuit. I definitely think it's in the in the sort of opera op amp circuits somewhere. But trying to diagnose that over video is very, very difficult to do. You really do need, I think at this point, if it's not any of the things that I've pointed out to this point, and you need to get an oscilloscope out if you're not comfortable and you don't understand electronics. And I do know where my limitations are, I have to be honest. And there are certain things where it gets to the point where I go, I'm stumped and I've got um, friends around me who understand electronics to a much deeper uh, level than I do. That's the point where the keyboard gets put in a box and gets wheeled off to them. Um, and I don't have to do it very often, I have to be honest. I've been lucky over the last uh, 10, plus years when I've restarted collecting vintage keyboards again uh, to say that I haven't really uh, found, uh, in fact I can only think of one instance where I've actually had to go and get one of my friends to go round the circuit board and work out what's going wrong with it. Um, I've had friends tell me what to look for but I've, I've only actually packed it up into a, into a box and sent it to a friend to have a look at once. There are a couple of other things you might want to do while you, you've got your keyboard open. And I uh, thought I'd share with you this little thing. Okay, this is my mini Hoover. Okay, so effectively, uh, 
when I open a keyboard up like this, uh, what I tend to do is I tend to like that. Just use that to to. Uh, now I know uh, that there's not very much dust in here, and the reason I know that is because when I opened it up the other day, I hoovered it. <laughs> <laughs> but I did it off camera, not thinking about actually talking about this thing on camera. Um, so um, there is not really very much dust in here, but what I quite like about this is it's it's battery pad, well, it's USB pad, so it's got a USB charger that plugs in there, which is really good for my new workshop setup with all the USB points behind me. Um, the rattling you can hear is something that's in the uh, the little Hoover thingy there. And um, it's it's got a little brush on it that's, uh, great for sort of getting in into in and out of things and the other thing is is because it's um, uh, plastic and it's not plugged in you don't tend to have very many static problems with this uh, although I probably wouldn't use this on a circuit board itself I would use it around the circuit board on everything that's grounded and as I said this is actually plugged into an earth source at the moment um, it's not powered on but it is earthed so there is um, uh, everything in the chassis, all this metal work in here, along the back here, and this silver work down the bottom here, um, that it's all screwed into, that is all earthed at the moment. This stuff here up here is earthed as well. So um, I know that there should theoretically be no static in here at all because of the fact you, I've created a, what is it, a Faraday cage uh, around all the electronics by earthing it. So, I hope that that is useful to somebody um, and the look at the inside of the T1 again, I, I, I can't say how much I enjoy this keyboard and given where I am at the moment with the Goldfish Bowl, I don't get that much chance to, to get keyboards of this sort of size out because at the end of the day, this thing is a full 88 weighted keyboard. It is heavy. Um, when Richard borrowed it off me and we lifted it into the car, I think his words were, go blimey gov. Actually, his words weren't, go blimey gov, but that gives you a kind of... <laughs> um, because the case for this, um, and again, I can't stress enough about having your keyboards in proper cases, um, I have to be honest and say material cases are all well and good and they provide a certain degree of uh, protection for your keyboard when it's on the move, especially if you are moving it yourself. Um, but if you get up to um, something that has intrinsic value on it, uh, a Kronos, uh, an Oasis, this thing has intrinsic value to me, uh, then a proper Ali style hard case is uh, the best thing you can do for this for, for two reasons. Number one, if you put this in storage, which I do a lot at the moment because of space issues, you it, it's fully protected. Uh, it's locked in its keyboard. Nothing can get nothing can get into the keyboard case. Um, so it's well protected from that perspective, and it's well protected when it's being moved to and from storage, um, which is what's going to happen tomorrow with this, unfortunately, because as I say, I can't. Um, get it in the goldfish bowl at the moment. So this was a rare glimpse. It was here, it's fortuitous that when Jeff raised the query, I had it here, I could show the internals of this, but uh, it is going back to storage, unfortunately, until the long-term solution arrives. Uh, and I will tell you what the long-term solution is at some point. Um, I do need to be generating a little bit more money. <laughs> Um, you know, so uh, support, 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 subscribe and like um, is always a good thing here. Um, if you're watching the videos, then you're earning me a little bit of money. And the other thing I should probably say at this point in time is by the time you see this video, uh, by the time it's gone through post, uh, the website should be live. So go check out the website. Um, it's still in very early days of construction as we are at the moment. Um, it's uh, but the blog is up and running, and there's some blog posts there. So subscribe to the website, uh, which you can find at the foot of most pages, 
uh, and you'll be notified every time a new blog arrives on the website. Isn't that good? Um, other things will go up onto the website. I intend to um, start doing case studies along the same lines as what I've done with the videos. So the videos will complement the case studies and the case studies will complement the videos. Um, but that's kind of work in progress going forward. Uh, the other thing I intend to do with the website is many of you have, um, thank you very much, uh, been buying the uh, discs off eBay. Um, and what I probably will do is I'm going to make those discs available through the website uh, once I work out how to get the web shop up and running. But um, please go and have a look at the website. Please subscribe to the website to be notified when blog uh, entries are, are uploaded. Um, and obviously normal Instagram and Facebook stuff. Anyway, for now, live long and prosper, and I'll catch you on the next video. Bye-bye.